I think we're still missing one, but we can do it later. Okay, so let's start the session. This is sort of the last session of this mini workshop. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have uh, Antoine Bourget from Imperial College in London, who will talk about a walk in the tropical rainforest or homogenized basis of 5D CFTs. So Antoine, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so good, uh, good afternoon, good, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm very happy to be part of this meeting and I would like to thank the, to thank the organizers for inviting me here. And I would like to apologize to those who already saw very recently a very similar talk. So you should really take a break now. And, um, and this talk will be based on a series of papers, uh, some of them with the um, Imperial team with uh, uh, the authors listed here, Santiago Cabrera, Julius Griminger, Amihai Hanani, Marcus Sperling, Anton Zayax, and Zheng Haochong. And, um, and then two papers with the Oxford team, Marike van Dist, uh, Julius Eckhart, and uh, Sakura. So uh, the goal of this talk will be to talk about moduli space of 5D SCFTs. And I will start with um, a brief introduction to this topic and then describe the recent uh, progresses. So 5D SCFTs are a very uh, interesting topic to study. Uh, first of all, they provide example of non-trivial CFTs in uh, more than four dimensions. And in this, the super supersymmetry is uh, very important and they are intrinsically strongly coupled. So these 5D SCFTs can be seen as the UV completion of gauge theories. It is well known that gauge theories in five dimensions have um, one over G young mills scales like the energy. And so this means that when your, the energy scale reaches that, that threshold, you reach a strong coupling regime. And um, conversely, in the infrared, the theory is generically free. So it could be thought that these theories are trivial, but as we have been knowing for more than 20 years now, um, UV fixed points exist, and these are the 5D SCFTs that I will be interested in today. And importantly, uh, distinct gauge theories can have the same UV completion. So a given SCFT can have, depending on its phase, different um, gauge theory uh, interpretations. Um, the other reason why those theories are so nice is because they have a very rich moduli space, which is the main uh, character of the talk today. And this moduli space can be studied uh, using geometry. And in particular, in the framework of string theory or M theory. And the basic uh, idea is that if you put M theory on um, Minkowski space, five dimensional Minkowski space times uh, Calabi-Yau three, which is taken to be a, a non-compact Calabi-Yau three with an isolated singularity, then generically on the, on the Minkowski space, you get a 5D SCFT, which here I call T of X, X being this uh, singular space. And the very nice feature of this realization is that the geometric properties of X will translate into physical properties of the theory and we can match the two and learn um, a collection of things that I will now uh, detail. So the, the main uh, correspondence is between various geometric parameters of the space X and the moduli space of the um, SCFT. So as for many supersymmetric uh, quantum field theories, we can distinguish a um, uh, Higgs branch and a Coulomb branch. And in the present case, actually, it is more relevant to talk about an extended Coulomb branch, which is not only parameterized by the scalars in the vector multiplets in a gauge theory uh, limit, but also by uh, masses that you can give to various uh, hypermultiplet. So this is the extended Coulomb branch. It is parameterized by those scalars that on this picture here, I denote by phi. 
and by masses that on this picture I denote by M. This is a very schematic picture. So this uh, kind of plane here denotes this extended Coulomb branch. And inside this, the standard Coulomb branch would be this uh, orange uh, subset parametrized just by the, um, the, the phi's. In terms of geometry, um, these correspond to divisors in the, um, in the space X, and the Coulomb branch would correspond to the compact divisors, while, while the, the non-compact divisor would correspond to um, these mass parameters. Um, but then there is another component to the, to the moduli space, which is the Higgs branch. And these Higgs branch are represented here as these cones, uh, these blue cones, which geometrically correspond to the complex structure deformations. And as you can see, um, I represented them as cones because it's very uh, important and it will be crucial in the discussion today that they are uh, singular spaces and typically hyperkeller uh, cones. And their geometric properties are very different from the Coulomb branch, since the Coulomb branch is a real space in five dimension, while the Higgs branch, as in any dimension, is a hyperkeller. So in particular, when I will give dimensions of the Higgs branch, I can always count in terms of quaternionic uh, dimension. Now, the, um, what is interesting is that this Higgs branch and Coulomb branch are not independent. You actually have many mixed branches in kind of old terminology. But the way of seeing this is should really be as Higgs branches depending on the position on which you are on the Coulomb branch. So if you are typically here at the origin of the Coulomb branch, this is where you have the SCFT, then there is a very large Higgs branch. And then if you move on the Coulomb branch, you turn on some Coulomb branch or extended Coulomb branch parameters, and this restricts the Higgs branch degrees of freedom, so the Higgs branch becomes smaller. Usually this is seen maybe in the other way. You have, for instance, a gauge theory, which has a particular Higgs branch, and then you turn the gauge coupling to infinity, and then when you hit infinity, the Higgs branch undergoes a sharp uh, transformation. So this discontinuous jump in the Higgs branch is very interesting because it's the manifestation of non-trivial and uh, strongly interacting physics. Um, and in the present case, it is, these jumps are due to instantons which become massless when you hit the, 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 the SCF, SCFT point. So the question is, how can we characterize this moduli space? in particular the Higgs branch. So the, the Coulomb branch have been studied um, by different methods over the years. And the Higgs branch, um, well, slightly less, and I will here focus on the Higgs branch. And we can ask uh, simple questions like, what are their dimensions? Uh, what are the, the isometry of the, um, of the Higgs branch, which coincide with the flavor symmetry of the theory and which depends on which point you are in? And can we know more, for instance, what kind of singularities there are, uh, etc. this kind of question. So uh, before going into the detail of the geometry of the Higgs branch, I want to, to focus on a particular class of 5D SCFTs, which I can also associate to a particular class of singularities X. So the singularity X can be engineered in uh, various ways. Uh, for instance, using uh, M-theory or F-theory. And a, a very nice uh, a depiction of this is using this um, um, not conformal, combined fiber diagrams here. Um, you can also have uh, a mixed brain and geometry picture using type 2A in which uh, you have these six brains uh, wrapping uh, certain cycles. But in the present talk, I will really focus on another picture, a 2B, type 2B picture, in which everything is described by brains. And the, the brains that we use are brain webs in type 2B. So these are webs of five brains, uh, NS5 and D5 brains, and D7 brains, as we will see. So on this uh, kind of map here, I show the standard brain webs are those represented here in orange. Uh, these are 
only five brains and you see you never have infinite parallel five brains so this will really realize um, an isolated singularity and the five brain has a dual toric diagram and this the the singularity x is really a toric singularity isolated toric you can go out of the realm of isolated singularities by adding parallel uh, five brain uh, yes parallel five brains as illustrated here in green so this is slightly larger class. The, it's still toric, but it's no longer isolated. And I will be considering those. And actually, I will consider much more than that. I will consider what we call generalized toric diagrams, which include these uh, white dots and not only black dots on the sides. And these correspond to brain webs in which you include seven brains on which the five brains can end. And crucially, several, several five brains can end on the same seven brain as illustrated here, for instance, in the blue web. And I should mention as well that in principle, you can go further. You can add, for instance, discrete actions on those webs. You can add oriented folds. You can add many things. So then this would go even beyond. But for today, I will limit myself to the, this blue uh, category. So, OK, with those theories, the toric diagram offers a nice way of uh, parameterizing how you move on the Coulomb branch and therefore how to characterize the Higgs branch at a given point on the Coulomb branch. So here I illustrate with my picture of before on, in, on a very simple theory, which is um, the SCFT that you obtain from an SU2 theory with one fundamental. And OK, I illustrate only part of the extended Coulomb branch here two parameters, the, so phi and the mass of the, of the fundamental, and different uh, sections of this uh, extended Coulomb branch are um, labeled by resolutions of the toric diagrams. And different phases are connected by flops, as shown here, for instance. And in each part, you can compute, you can ask what is the Higgs branch, and this I will address uh, in the next slide. However, the thing I wanted to mention here is that not only you have the SCFT point at the origin and then various deformations when you go out of the origin and you move on the Coulomb branch, but you can also have a whole reach other SCFTs, even if you're not at the origin. For this, you, for instance, turn on a mass, you give a mass to this fundamental hyper, and then you'll just let the RG flow run. And at the end of this run, you will hit another SCFT. And well, you could also reach other parts, but uh, what I want to show here is that you can, uh, by this decoupling process, reach other SCFTs. And this has a whole formulation in terms of the geometry of X as well. In terms of the brain webs, uh, it's just a dual of what happens in the toric diagram. So this is the standard uh, flop and then sending a particular um, isolated brain to, to infinity. So the simplest of these uh, descendants that we can realize would start from uh, the famous E8 theory found by uh, Cyberg uh, long ago. And actually this one descends from a 6D marginal theory, which would be SU2 with eight flavors. Uh, so this is the, the E string. And so you start from a 6D marginal theory and then you apply this process of decoupling uh, matter to get a whole tree of descendants. And here uh, I show this, uh, this tree in the case of the descendants of this E string. And in each case, this, this can really be seen as moving on the extended Coulomb branch of the top, uh, the top guy. So here the, the E8. And in each case, you can ask, OK, what is the Higgs branch? What is the geometry? And what are the, the transitions? It turns out that in this case, it's quite easy. Uh, you have a, th this labeling actually corresponds to the flavor symmetry. And in each case, the Higgs branch can be identified with the closure of the minimal nilpotent orbit of the corresponding algebra, so E8, E7, E6, etc. And the other reason why I show this uh, graph is because uh, you can see the use the usefulness of these generalized toric diagrams. With the generalized toric diagrams, so in blue here, 
you can really cover the whole uh, landscape of those theories. Whereas if you restricted yourself to standard toric, even if you include non-isolated, you just cover a, a subset of it. So this is a very nice um, and very natural set of theories to, to study. And finally, I said that the Higgs branch here is this closure of minimal nilpotent orbits. And it is known that those closure of minimal nilpotent orbits can also be interpreted as the Coulomb branch of certain 3D n equal 4 theories, um, and actually quiver theories. So if you take a quiver theory, which uh, the quiver has the shape of an affine Dinkin diagram of a certain, say, a simply laced Lie algebra with ranks of the unitary groups equal to the marks of this algebra, then you can show that the 3D, the, the, yes, the Coulomb branch of this 3D n equal 4 theory is the closure of that minimal nilpotent orbit. And this connection between the Higgs branch of those 5D theories and the Coulomb branch of 3D theories will be the key to understand the Higgs branch. So, and for that reason, we call this quiver that whose 3D Coulomb branch realized the Higgs branch a magnetic quiver. So the goal will be to find these magnetic quivers because they, they offer a description. Let's see what we can learn with those quivers. So here is an example. Um, I take a certain uh, brain web or equivalently a toric polygon or generalized toric polygon. And then there is an algorithm that I will not have time to describe here, which can involve either polygon coloring. So this is a purely combinatorial uh, algorithm or brain decompositions, which is also combinatorial, even though, well, slightly different, but basically equivalent algorithms, they produce out of a certain brain web or polygon, they produce a magnetic quiver. So here is an example. And from that quiver, you already know a collection of things about the Higgs branch. For instance, you can know its dimension, which can be obtained by adding up all the values of the ranks here. You can also know the global symmetry by looking at the nodes which are so-called balanced and looking at the Dinkin diagrams that they form. So for instance, here you find an A5 times A1 times A1 global symmetry. And for instance, this can be used to diagnose the symmetry enhancement when you, when you reach certain points in the extended Coulomb range. And you can know even more. And to explain this additional thing that you can know, I have to make a little detour through the notion of symplectic singularity. These Higgs branch, they are symplectic singularities, which are a particular class of um, spaces. And these typically admit a stratification in terms of symplectic leaves. And those leaves are connected to each other by minimal degenerations, which in the classical setting uh, realize the Higgs mechanism. So this is a generaliz generalization of the Higgs mechanism. So typical example of symplectic singularities are the Duval uh, or Klein singularities, C2 mod and ADE group, or the minimal nilpotent orbits that we already met. But in general, those things will be combined in a particular way, which, uh, which um, describe how the singularities are embedded into one another. And this can be summarized in the form of a Hasser diagram, which uh, denotes the partial order of those um, symplectic leaves and the singularities that connect them. And uh, one observation is that the global symmetry can be read here at the root of the Hasser diagram. So uh, to, to summarize, to characterize the Higgs branch, it is enough to know the magnetic quiver. Why? Because the magnetic quiver gives you dimension, global symmetry, and through another algorithm called quiver subtraction, which I will not detail here, you can get the Hasse diagram, so the full structure of singularities, also the complete set of Higgsings that are possible to do, et cetera, and much more information. So um, these, these magnetic quivers um, can be obtained if you know what is the starting polygon. So in the recent work that we did with uh, 
Sakura, Marike, and Julius, we focused on a set of theories with gauge group SUN, certain number of fundamentals and antisymmetrics, and using some uh, previous work with brain waves, uh, in particular by Gadi Zafrir, we can uh, read out rules that allow to construct toric polygons or generalized toric polygons, which allow to construct um, the polygon for any such theory with certain any number of uh, fundamentals, antisymmetrics, and John Simon's level. So this is one example of a polygon like this. And then the decoupling, so moving from one SCFT to the next in the possible trees, is given by um, doing these flop transitions. And for instance, here you see that there are three possible flop transitions. You can flop at the top of the diagram. This would amount to decoupling a fundamental hyper uh, with a positive mass. Uh, you can flop at the bottom here with negative mass, or you can flop here, and this is a generalized flop, and this will decouple the antisymmetric hyper. And you can check that there are some consistency conditions which make that, um, in particular, the chan simons level is shifted by the right amount when you, when you do the, these transitions. So now there are some um, difficulties which appear. As you can see, the polygons are not convex here, and this is, um, this is a, a problem when you want to reach the SCFT point, because you the, the, remember that these polygons are dual to brain waves, and you want to go to the origin of the Coulomb branch, so you want to blow down every uh, cycle which is inside, and to do that, the polygon needs to be convex. So there is there are various things that you can do to, to, to have these convex polygons, but okay, it can be done. And in the end, you get the polygon and you apply the algorithms that we developed and you obtain the magnetic quiver and the Hasse diagram. So for instance, here, I, I took this example of an, I didn't write it, but it's SU6 at level uh, five halves and uh, with the seven flavors and one antisymmetric. And you learn that the, the Higgs branch is described by this magnetic quiver. So the, its dimension is the sum of all these numbers, minus one. Its global symmetry is SU8 plus U1 plus U1. Its Hasse diagram it is um, this one shown here. And you can repeat this process to describe a whole class of theories. So for instance here, just as an example, this is one among many tables. Uh, you'd start from a certain 6D theory, uh, so, which is the marginal theory here. So the, the, this theory is SU2N, level N, one antisymmetric and eight flavors. And then you decouple, so you move along the extended Coulomb branch while always staying in the SCFT regime. And you, you can go down in the lines of this table and in each case, we have these um, magnetic quivers, which then describe the, um, the Coulomb branch, the, the Higgs branch, sorry, on the, of all those theories. And you can uh, check that this agrees with, um, with other computations of the same trees. In particular, it agrees with the global symmetries when they are computed and with the dimensions if they are computed. And in, actually the dimensions are more difficult to get. And of course the singularity structure was not computed before. So this is new result. So to summarize, what we get with this approach is a purely algorithmic technique based on the combinatorics of these polygons and generalized toric polygons, which allow to characterize the Higgs branch of 5D SCFTs of a very large one, large class of 5D SCFTs even though there are some uh, challenges due to the algorithms. Uh, we describe the Higgs branch quite precisely, including the global symmetry, which uh, can be uh, sometimes non-simply laced, and all this can be covered by the, by the algorithms and the singularity structure everywhere on the Coulomb branch. Here, I did not mention too much the transitions in other phases, like uh, so non-SCFT phases, but the algorithm really goes through. We reproduce these decoupling trees, which have been uh, studied in many papers. And here I cite a few authors who studied this in, in detail. And for the quiver uh, aficionados, 
Um, this provides many new families of, um, of quivers and therefore of moduli spaces that can be studied and can be put in a wider context, for instance, in the context of the moduli space of instantons or um, other works in, in progress about the slices in the affine Grassmannian and other um, places where these, uh, these, these uh, hyperkeller symplectic singularities can appear. So these are the, the results. The, in, in the yellow here, I included a few uh, open questions. So again, I said the algorithm has some very uh, uh, difficult parts which uh, could be developed uh, better. And also from the point of view of singularities, this moduli space of instantons somehow uh, are still a bit um, difficult to understand using quiver subtraction. So there is still a lot to do to understand uh, all these uh, Higgs branches, but um, they are uh, substantial progress. And to conclude, uh, I just want to leave you on this uh, image of this rainforest, which uh, is the, again, my image from the beginning with this Coulomb branch. So here I took just a slightly more involved uh, theory than the SU2. So here I took a rank two, so SU3 uh, with 10 flavors. This is a marginal 6D theory, and then you you decouple hypers one after the other and in each case you move on the coulomb branch and uh, each um, each higgs branch can be described by its hasse diagram that as you can see is a kind of forest of decreasing of trees with decreasing uh, heights and and the 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 the, the full geometry of this moduli space is really quite uh, fascinating when you see that you have this base, which is a 12 real dimensional uh, base on which you have some 46 quaternionic dimensional Higgs branches and how everything is connected with these various uh, transverse slices. And so again, th these points here are leaves in the Higgs branch, which are connected via these this symplectic uh, elementary slices. And on the other hand, these various points at the roots are connected, for instance, by um, transition, transitions in the um, combined fiber diagrams, for instance. So I leave you with this um, picture and I thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Let's thank Antoine virtually or... Thank you. Okay. Are there questions? Uh, you can just unmute yourself if you have questions. Yeah, I, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, Maybe, maybe you said it in the beginning, but um, can you also, I mean, in principle, you can also compute uh, data like the, the one form symmetries, for example, in these, uh, in these geometries and incorporate them, I guess, in your, uh, in, in these Hasse diagram trees and I mean, stuff like how the breaking is and especially like the example you have there, I think has like a Z2 or Z4 uh, center one form symmetry in 60. And uh, so uh, is this something you're considering? Yes, so thank you for, for the question. Um, so I'm aware, of course, of this question, and this can be computed in, in some cases based on the, on the polygons. Once you have a convex polygon, you can apply some uh, formulas to compute these uh, one-form symmetries. But I, as far as I'm aware, this has not been really integrated with, the, for instance, the Hasse diagrams and, and all of this. So this could be interesting to do. As far as I know, it has not been done. Um, however, I should also mention here that this kind of questions is important when uh, computing really what does it mean? What does this um, magnetic quiver mean? And in particular, what is the global structure of the gauge groups there? I said it, there are U groups, yeah. but uh, typically there could be some discrete quotient. And this is even more important if you add orientifolds when then you have orthogonal, special orthogonal groups. So we are uh, aware of these questions and we have, we have been uh, studying this particular aspect, um, but I don't mm -hmm. think there is full understanding yet, but it's a very oh, yeah. interesting and important point indeed. So thanks. Oh, yeah, good. Cool, thanks, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I again see a clapping hand. That's not a raised hand. <laughs> um, okay, so let's thank Antoine again then.
we'll have more questions at the end. Thank you very and much. And if we can move over to um, the next speaker, which is Gianluca. Thank you. Yeah. Can you share your screen, please? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so our next speaker is Gianluca Toccarato from UPenn, and he'll talk about S-fold string junctions and 40 n equals 2 as CFTs. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for putting together this seminar series and uh, this uh, workshop and also giving me the opportunity to speak here. So I will present, uh, um, uh, I will talk about this paper that we published in September with people at Penn, with Jonathan, Craig, Thomas, and Howe. And uh, the main topic will be s fold, as you can see from the title. We heard about that uh, yesterday in Simone's talk, and uh, there will be some overlap, but the techniques we employed are different. So let me start by saying that, well, we all like uh, uh, super conformative theories. They are very important. And then string theory has been very important in the study of super conformative theories, uh, both for construction, is given classification schemes, and also computational techniques. And um, separately, we know that in, for, in the case of 4D n equals to 2 theories, uh, there is a classification of Coulomb branch geometries, at least for theories of rank 1. This was done by the Cincinnati group. And, uh, and actually, there's been works recently uh, extending this to higher rank, which is very exciting. Uh, so one important thing is that can we build this from string theory? So one a uh, very famous way to build super conformal field theories in string theories to use the three brains. You can put them uh, close to a stack of, this, of seven brains uh, that produce a conformal invariant uh, geometry. And then you realize that for the n equals two software conformal field theory in the board volume. And uh, another way that's been uh, uh, discovered uh, rather recently is to use what are called s fold planes. Uh, in this case, when you put, place a D3 brain close to uh, an S4 plane, you pr produce an N equals to 3 super conformative theory in the volume of the D3 brains. So the idea to combine these two was, uh, came from the beginning of this year from the Oxford group. And uh, in addition to our paper, there's been several, uh, several other papers uh, talking about these theories. So, our focus has been to study these theories using string junction techniques. So we will start, I will start by discussing uh, which kind of stack of seven brains are compatible with the S fold, and then use this information to provide a, a working definition of the S fold projection on the string junctions, which gives uh, the generalization of the oriented fold projection <laughs> that we are all familiar with from uh, perturbative string theory. Uh, this is a very powerful technique because it allows us to check what is the flavor symmetry of the superconformity theory. And moreover, by building some uh, states, uh, we can check what is the global structure of the flavor symmetry group in some cases. Um, <clears throat> we will uh, uh, use this, uh, uh, we will use uh, n equals to two information to give some working definition of the geometry as seen by the three brains in the case of uh, when discrete, there is discrete torsion. And finally, we'll discuss uh, central charges of the theory. Uh, so let me start by discussing what are S-fold planes. These were introduced at the end of 2015. Uh, and they are basically a generalization of oriented fold three planes. Uh, the best way to define them is to use F theory. You can define them via an orbifold, a ZK orbifold of C3 times D2. Uh, I wrote the, the uh, generator of the ZK group, and um, where zeta is, uh, where the zeta here is uh, basically a kth primitive root of unity. So this kind of singularity is terminal, it doesn't emit an increment resolution. And, uh, and due to compatibility, uh, due to, to have a compatible action on the torus, uh, you need to restrict k to some specific values, that is 2, 3, 4, and 6. So the k equals 2 is simply the conventional on the oriented for 3 plane, but uh, uh, for k greater than 2, there are new objects, 
And uh, since there is an action on the elliptic, fi elliptic fiber of F theory, uh, you can see that uh, this, from the point of view of type 2b, this produces an SM2c transformation. Uh, when you probe uh, the asphalt brain with the D3 brains, uh, if k greater than 2, you will recover an n equals to 3 theory. And uh, it's important to notice that uh, the axial dilaton is fixed, so there is no marginal deformation for these theories when k is greater than 2. For k equals 2, the value of the axial dilaton is not fixed. So one important thing in the following will be that uh, as for planes come in variants, uh, we already know from oriented for planes that there are different kinds of oriented for planes. Uh, and uh, to understand which kind of uh, orient, uh, asphalt planes are allowed, uh, it's convenient to talk about the holographic dual. Uh, the near horizon geometry is uh, ADS5 times S5 mod CK. And uh, in this case, you can talk about discrete torsion, which corresponds to different choices of NS and S and Ramor Ramon form fluxes in the, the geometry. In particular, what you need to compute is some kind, some cohomology groups of the sphere. Uh, and uh, this was done by Aaron and Tachikawa. And uh, the, subscript, the subscript rho here denotes the fact that the fluxes uh, see the action of uh, the S2C transformation that is produced by the asphalt plane. So the computation was done in, by Aaron and Tachikawa. For the case, case uh, k equals two, you recover the familiar classification of oriented for three plane. There are four kinds of oriented for three planes. Uh, for k equals three, there are three different uh, oriented for three planes, uh, asphalt planes, and uh, um, the ones that are they have non-trivial discrete torsion, they are actually interchanged among each other uh, under an uh, uh, S2C transformation. And uh, for k equals four, there's only one non-trivial. And for k equals six, there's no non-trivial uh, uh, <coughs> asphalt plane. And another important ingredient in the following would be the d charge of the asphalt plane, uh, which was again computed by Ron and Tachikawa the plus value corresponds to the uh, case without the discrete torsion, the minus sign corresponds to the case with the discrete torsion. Okay, so um, we now want to understand which kind of uh, seven brains are allowed in the presence of an asphalt plane. Uh, one way to do it is to use a bias model. Uh, we can write the elliptic vibration, uh, here, here F and G will depend on the base coordinate, Z1, Z2, Z3. However, due to the fact that we are introducing an orbifold, um, this F and G will become ZK equivalent section. And by homogeneity of the Weierstrass model, the same will happen with uh, X and Y. I wrote here, which uh, bundles their section of, and the KB is the canonical class of the base. Uh, in particular, for the case of an orbifold, uh, a section of uh, O minus LKB uh, transforms as the determinant of gamma to the L, where gamma is the matrix that gives the uh, orbifold action on the coordinates. So one way to check which, which uh, forms of F and G are allowed is to uh, write them as polynomials, and then require that they are section of the appropriate bundles. But uh, in the following, we will restrict to the case uh, where we have uh, n equals to two supersymmetry. So f and g will depend only on one coordinate, which call it z3. And uh, in, in the following, I will simply call it z, because it's the only one appearing. And uh, I, uh, moreover, we want to avoid non-canonical singularities. And we demand that the degree of F and the degree of G are uh, less than four and six respectively. So I wrote, uh, here's a table with the possible values. Uh, for K equals two, you can have type four star, type I not star and type four fibers. Uh, for K equals three, it's a not star and type three. And for K equals four, you get a type four fiber. For K equals six, there's no uh, brains that are allowed. <laughs> so I will give some more details for the case of a type four star fiber, which gives uh, an E6 singularity. Uh, 
the one way is convenient to write the most general mass deformation that's uh, uh, compatible with this equal to quotient. And uh, from the point of view of the n equals to two theory on a probe D3 brain, uh, this would be the identified with the cyber quitter curve and Z will be the Coulomb branch operator, which has dimension three. This is fixed by homogeneity. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, the disadvantage here is that the coordinates are not invariant under the orbifold, and therefore it's better to perform a rescaling and uh, a redefine a new Coulomb branch uh, parameter, which we call U, which is invariant under the U2 action. And uh, at the end of the day, the results is the following. Once you turn off all the mass deformation, the kind of singularity you get is a two star. And uh, one can check in the literature and, and this cyber width and curve was already found in 2016 by the people, by the group in Cincinnati. And uh, it corresponds to a theory that has F4 global symmetry. So this suggests that in this case, you recover an F4 global symmetry. However, uh, this kind of identification between geometry, cyber width and curve works only with, uh, in the case without discrete torsion, and moreover, we would like to have uh, a, an independent way to check uh, which, uh, which is the flavor symmetry. So in the following, we will, uh, we start talking about string junction that would provide a further check of the globe, of the flavor symmetry. So string junctions are basically bound states of PQ strings that are, uh, um, available in type 2b string theory and uh, the <coughs> and a pq string can end as expected on a pq7 brain so <coughs> um, so uh, one the advantage of string junctions is that they can uh, using uh, the appropriate brain systems one can reproduce root system of all ade algebras uh, there are two conditions to reproduce all the roots the, uh, of the system, the root system. One is that the total PQ charge is zero. And the second one is that the self-intersection of the junctions uh, is minus two, which corresponds to the condition uh, in the root system that all the roots have length two. And uh, um, <coughs> In particular, in all the systems that we discussed, we only needed some, uh, in general, four kinds of seven brains. We, we needed the conventional D7 brain, the 1,0, which we call type A, the 1 minus 1, which is called type B, the 1, 1, which is type C, and 0, 1, which is type D. Uh, and the next thing that was important to understand is that, uh, the, the, the roots, uh, the brain systems that were given in the literature um, uh, are actually not in general compatible with the CK action. For instance, one way to represent E6 is to use five tape brains of type A, one of type B, and two of type C. However, it's possible to rearrange the brain system in a way to, um, <coughs> in a way to be compatible with the C2 symmetry. Uh, for the case of D4, you can arrange them to be compatible with the C3 symmetry. And from the case of the H2 theory, which is the Girostarus theory, you can uh, arrange them to be compatible with a, a <coughs> Z4 symmetry. All the other cases descend from this by just by simply removing some brains from these systems. And uh, <coughs> so we need to understand how the uh, S-fold projection acts on the system. However, we start by reviewing how the oriented projection works. So in perturbative string theory, we know very well how the oriented projection works. You take the champ Payton factor and you do a conjugation via matrix M and a transposition of the champ Payton factors. And um, depending on the choice of M, you get either the SO projection or the SP projection. If M is symmetric, you get the SO projection. If M is under symmetric, you get the SP projection. <coughs> However, for our purposes, it's convenient to have a more geometric picture. And uh, <coughs> basically what, uh, uh, one way to write it is that the, uh, the orientation reversal 
basically uh, interchange changes the orientation of the strings as expected and uh, uh, maps the endpoint to the, of the string to a different kind of brains. I will use a pictorial uh, definition of this in a second, but I wrote it here mathematically. Uh, it's important to note that there can be some phases uh, which we call the uh, gamma omega. For the SP projection, this is always one. For the SO projection, this can be minus one depending on the kind of strings that appear. This simply follows from the definition and uh, it can lead to some uh, strings to be projected out. So the kind of picture we have is the following. Uh, we can start from a star state ij and what the orient for uh, the uh, <coughs> the orientation reversal does is to map it to somehow the mirror version of this is pretty intuitive the action and um, plus the phase and the the, the system in the case in which the phase is relevant is when the uh, the brains that uh, on which the string ends are mapped onto each other. For instance, a string between this and this brain would be mapped uh, onto each other uh, <coughs> under the projection. And therefore there is a possibility that the state is projected out if uh, some phases appear. So we generalize this to the asphalt case. Uh, in this case, we can we, we call in pi k the generator of the ZK action. We can form uh, the invariant junctions by simply summing uh, over <coughs> the over the various images okay and uh, again i will give a pictorial definition in a second but it's important to notice that the operator pi k can have some faces that are basically the manifestation of discrete torsion and it's important always for uh, junctions that are invariant under the projection in particular, uh, the phase acquired by a PQ junction, in general, if it crosses the orientifold, uh, the S fold is uh, uh, for K equals, well, we wrote them here, uh, where A and B are the, <coughs> uh, the tor discrete torsional pluses. And this, uh, this kind of a pairing between the charge and the fluxes has been fixed by requiring compatibility with the equivalence relations in the cohomology groups that uh, I discussed before. And uh, all of this is compatible with the SL2C transformations. Uh, so the kind of action that we imagine is the following. We have uh, a, a, a string junction here, and then uh, the uh, basically the <coughs> the operator pi k maps it to several different images and we sum over all these images to get the invariant states. So <clears throat> I will discuss now one example and this is the S for the, uh, of the type for star fiber. Again, we start with the E6. Here I give a, a, a pictorial representation of the brain system in a way that's compatible with the C2 action and uh, you can see drawn are the simple roots that give the root system, uh, <coughs> they give the thinking diagram basically of E6. Uh, one can perform the quotient, and in the case when you don't have discrete torsion, the flavor symmetry will at the end be a uh, four. When you have discrete torsion, the flavor symmetry will be C4 independently of the choice of discrete torsion you make. So all oriented for three plane will always give C4 and uh, here I drew the result. Uh, this is the conventional oriented for three plane and giving F4. And this is the case uh, uh, that gives uh, a symplectic group. Uh, one interesting observation is that even though you always recover a C4 algebra, the kind of junctions that survive the projection are different for the different uh, choices of oriented for three plane. And um, <clears throat> this is just a summary. We did the same for all uh, as for projection. The, here uh, we write the initial theory and the kind of quotients that we perform. The hatted version is the case uh, with discrete torsion. And uh, it's important to note that you can flow from one theory to the other uh, vertically. So for instance, you can flow from the F4 theory to the B3 theory and then to the A 
two theory. And geometrically, this corresponds to moving the brains away. And this is compatible with the results that were known in the literature, which is very good, I would say. It gives uh, independent confirmation of this. Uh, <coughs> the results that were already available. And uh, <laughs> one advantage of string junctions that we can also build uh, junctions uh, that are not simply the one of the root system. Uh, for example, if you check here, you have uh, that the Z2 quotient of the D4 theory gives uh, a theory that has B3, uh, fla uh, algebra B3, but we don't know whether the, uh, the flavor group will be spin 7 or SO7. And in this case, it's possible to check that there are junction in the spinor representation, which uh, confirms that the flavor group is spin 7. Uh, I didn't write here all the cases, also because uh, in the case without, uh, with discrete torsion, uh, <clears throat> it seems that this uh, group is not simply connected. And uh, however, there can be states uh, that are charged under geometric symmetries uh, that mix with the symmetry groups of the seven brains that we are not able to see. We know that at least for the theories of low rank, there can be uh, some uh, enhancements of the flavor symmetry, which we are not able to see from this picture. We are only able to check the symmetry on the seven brains. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, <clears throat> so one uh, advantage of the theory construction is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the cyber witten curve and the profile for the rank one theory at least, and the profile of the axiodilaton uh, sourced by the stack of seven brains. However, uh, this works only in the case without discrete torsion. Uh, when the, there is discrete uh, torsion present, uh, <coughs> there is this correspondence phase because the cyber witten curve is different even though the uh, kind of axiodilaton that is sourced is the same. However, we can try to turn this around <coughs> and see and try to define the geometry in the presence of discrete torsion. We can use the three brains as probes of this geometry and say that the geometries they see is actually the cyber witten theory of the theory, uh, the cyber witten curve of the theory. So, for, for example, I copied here the case of the this Z2 quotient of the E6 theory. Uh, <clears throat> this would be the, basically the kind of uh, elliptic vibration that you can expect in the presence of discrete torsion. So this is more speculative, but it's an interesting ob observation. And uh, I would like to conclude by discussing the computation of central charges. So this follows what was done by Aroni and Tachikawa, and it was already done from the Oxford group, uh, <clears throat> at least for the cases of theories uh, uh, with discrete torsion. So we focused on the case without discrete torsion. So the holographic dual, which I discussed before, is ADS5 times S5 mod CK, give, uh, <coughs> allows us to compute the central charges. So <coughs> the order, uh, so uh, uh, we can separate the various terms according to how they scale on, uh, depending on the number of the three brains that are present. So calling n the number of the three brains, we can have uh, terms that are order n squared. These are induced by the d brain charge. <coughs> and uh, it's basically the square of the total d brain charge divided by the volume of the internal manifold, which I call V5. And this volume is the volume of the pi sphere divided by k because there is a quotient and delta. Delta is the <coughs> dimension of the Coulomb branch operator of the parent theory before quotienting, but it's also basically identified geometrically as the deficit angle produced by the seven brains. And the total charge is important to notice that it depends on uh, the number of the three brains, but also on the charge that induced by the s fold plane. <coughs> Uh, the order and term since induced by the Chan Simons term, it in, involves quantities that are already defined and it's written here. And uh, <clears throat> the, there are order one terms the, which are notoriously difficult to compute. And in this case, the order one terms seem to be induced by the presence of this epsilon, for example, when you expand this or this term. Uh, these need to be cancelled to reproduce the correct result. This happens already for n equals to three and uh, even for the case of n equals to four theories realized in this 
similar to this. So I wrote here the results and uh, all of this is compatible with what was known in the literature. And uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm finished. So let me give a brief recap. So basically we studied uh, N equals to two superconformal field theories that are realized on the three brains that probe a stack of the seven brains sitting on top of an s fold plane. Uh, <clears throat> we defined the s fold projection of string junction states, which allowed us to prove directly what the flavor symmetry group of the theory is. And uh, also to check what kind of allowed representation there are. Uh, another part that I discussed is to use the cyber width and curve of the superconformal field theory in the case with the uh, discrete torsion to give a working definition of the geometry as seen by a probe D3 plane. And finally discuss the computation of the central charges of the theories using holography. And this is all and I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Other questions for Gianluca? I can see Matteo Lutito, you have unmuted yourself. Yes, I have a question, sorry, quick. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Quick uh, thing, so in the table I saw, I think the four star fiber mod a Z2 hat, so a Z2 with torsion, right? Uh, that should correspond to a C5, uh, to the C5 theory. But I think you can only see a C4 in, in I guess, in your construction. What, do you know why or? or? Yeah, so um, in this case, there is a, uh, we can only see a C4 on the volume of the seven brains. And there is also an SU2 symmetry that comes as an isometry of the background. And uh, there is the expectation that these two combine at least uh, at rank one to give uh, the full uh, C5 theory. So from the seven brains, we're only able to see the C4. But then for instance, you're thinking or you're expecting that a higher rank, this uh, combin recombination does not apply. Uh, we don't expect that because, uh, so uh, let me go. Um, well, I don't think you can see it, but um, the flavor central charges of the, the, the uh, symmetries are different when you increase the rank. Mm -hmm. So they con they coincide only at rank one. I think maybe rank two, I don't remember that case, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the higher the rank, you don't expect them to uh, enhance. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. How would you, um... Is there a way you could see the full flavor symmetry? Is there some calculation you can do to see not just the thing on the seven brain, but the whole combined symmetry uh, from looking at your configuration? Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't really know how to check that because uh, at least, uh, at least with the techniques of string junction, I don't think you can access that. You can only check what happens uh, on the seven brains. And uh, at the moment, I cannot come up with any other independent check of the enhancement of the flavor symmetry. I think Philip Adiris just had a question too. No? Uh, no, I didn't have one. Oh, okay, because <laughs> I, it looked like you had unmuted yourself. Are there any other questions? I'll make a comment. In principle, you could see the enhancement if you could somehow study the world volume theory of the string junctions. Mm -hmm. So in other words, SU2 presumably acts in some way, but yeah. making that precise sounds quite difficult. But. Right, because these are some complicated PQ strings with various PQ charges, yes. Right, but, but that's the sense in which uh, this, the PQ mm -hmm. string knows about all the symmetries. Right, <clears throat> cool, thanks. Okay, so we are actually really dead on time. Um, thank you very much, Gianluca. Let's move thank on you. to the next and final speaker. Uh, so I think, Ibu, you will have to make Luigi, I think, Gianluca first. Uh, Ibu, can you make Luigi co-host, please? Okay, so Luigi, if you can try to share your slides. Can you, can you see? Yeah, but they're not full screen. Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. Okay, perfect. So the perfect. final speaker of 
this mini workshop is uh, Luigi Titano from the Simon Center in Stony Brook, and he'll talk about delayed deconfinement and the Hawking page transition. So please, Luigi, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to speak here uh, today. Today I'm gonna talk about a work that appeared uh, last August in collaboration with Christian Copetti, Alba Grassi, and Zohar Komargotsky. And our goal was to revisit uh, certain questions uh, that have to do uh, with the uh, large end deconfinement transition and uh, the physics of black holes in the dual ADS uh, picture. So uh, in large end Yamil's theory, uh, a useful criterion to, divide, to, to decide whether or not the theory is confining or deconfining is to study the free energy and it studied the, more precisely to study the scaling at large n of the free energy. If the free energy scales as order one at large n, we would say that the phase of the theory that is realized is a confined phase, which receives contribution from color singlets. Instead, if we find that the free energy at large n scales as order n squared, we expect that the phase that the theory realizes is a deconfined one where we have contribution for, from liberated gluons. Now, it was understood a long time ago, and maybe like one of the very first non-trivial check of the ADS-CFT correspondence, that this deconfinement transition in large end gauge theory has a precise dual in terms of the black hole formation in ADS, and is more precisely can be understood by comparing it with the thermodynamics of ADS black hole in AD, uh, that was studied by Hawking and Page long time ago. Now, uh, our, my goal today and our goal in this work was to revisit this, uh, this set of ideas in the context of N equal four super young meals, but we wanted to do that for a slightly different ob observable that is the super conformal index. So we wanted to focus on this object and just uh, try to study if uh, this object can deconfine and so account for a Hawking page transition. Now, if such object has a deconfinement phase transition, uh, the candidate uh, dual description of such phase would be a supersymmetric black hole in ADS-5. And these have been known for uh, quite some time and they are extremely special black holes because they, are, they have zero Hawking temperature. And they are characterized by an entropy that grows as order n squared. So it is clearly a natural question uh, whether or not we can um, capture this huge degeneracy in the boundary QFT. And I would want to emphasize that uh, there, there has been a recent development starting by the end of 2018 by the work of these three different groups that really uh, renewed the interest in this problem. And if you are interested in many recent development that I don't have the time to talk about today, I, I invite you to go to the Simon Center website where you can find a series of online seminar where many of the development in this subject have been reviewed. So uh, let me remind you some basic facts uh, about the study of large and deconfinement transition in uh, gauge theories. And this was uh, pioneered in old works by these authors and it, the main character here is the study of a unitary matrix model which has the following form. The action has an infinite sum over double trace interaction. You here are unitary matrix and these an coefficients are some theory dependent coefficients that are uh, known precisely and they are, uh, they are real. And it is very, um, so the, the standard picture for the phase transition in this uh, uh, story is the following. So when the an minus one couplings are negative, that means that uh, all these coefficients uh, in the exponential and so in the action will be negative. You see that at large end, the most dominant contribution that will maximize the action is that the one where the trace of u to the n is zero. And that means that uh, the, first of all, the eigenvalue will always be spread um, on the unit circle. And we expect that uh, in this regime where these couplings are negative, the model will exhibit a, confinement, a confining phase. Conversely, if some of these an minus one flip sign and so become positive, now the eigenvalue will have a distribution over a smaller subset of the unit circle. 
This is commonly referred to as a gapped phase. It's uh, gapped in the sense that the eigenvalue develop a gap. And here the center symmetry is broken and we expect that at large n, the model will show a free energy that scale as order n squared and so a deconfined phase. So basically the important and special point in this entire discussion is the point where the sign of the couplings an minus one changes from negative to positive. And in the large n analysis, we are uh, instructed that when this happens, we have to discard the confined saddle and go to the deconfined saddle. And let me emphasize that in this description, there is never uh, a regime where these two phases coexist. So when one exists, the other doesn't and vice versa. And so it is better to refer to this kind of phase transition as weakly first order. So today I'll take this as a definition of a weakly first order transition. So today I want to convince you that if you switch and study this model again, but with complex coupling ANs, so now ANs will be complex and I will explain you later why this is useful. We have to revise this logic and in particular, uh, we have to revise the following point. So we could just take the attitude that everything will go through as it did before and just place, just look at the real part of all this coupling and then think that the only point that will be special in this complex situation is where the real part of the couplings will, will switch sign. But it turns out that this is much more subtle than, than this because uh, the large N analysis now will be a large N analysis for a complex matrix model that receive additional cancellation. And that makes it so that where before we expected to find a phase transition, we will not find one. So the, in a some sense, the point where the real part of the N minus one changes sign, no, it now is not special in any sense. And this is a phenomenon that uh, we call the delayed deconfinement. In particular now, uh, in this model with complex coupling, the physics is actually, the, the transition is described by a first order phase transition. And this also will have important consequences for the gravitational dual. So here I really mean a first order, meaning that there will be two phases coexisting and switching their dominance. So uh, let me explain you how we go about studying the matrix model at, uh, with, so with this complex coupling. And in order to kind of simplify this entire discussion, I'm gonna focus on a model where we only keep one, one coupling, which I call A1, and I'm gonna parameterize this like this with the phase phi. And in order to study this model, uh, it is also very useful to introduce a trick that's been known for a while that, uh, so basically you introduce an auxiliary field that's called the abarth strotonovich field. And it has a useful effect to basically uh, let us, it let us recast the original matrix integral as, a, as two different integral and so to decouple the double trace interaction. So here on the right here, we have a, a matrix integral that has a very famous form. I'm gonna introduce it very soon. And here on the right, we also have another integral to perform which now has to be done over a complex G plane because now this variable G has been promoted to be complex. And so for uh, convergence re reasons, I'm gonna assume that the real part of A1 is positive and that the contour in the G plane will be defined as a line uh, which is specified by the phase of this A1 that I introduced here. Now, I said that this second integral is known, and in fact, this, this integral has a famous history. It's uh, the matrix integral that defined the gross width and wadia matrix model. In particular, a lot of things are known for this matrix model when G is a real parameter. Um, and in particular, it is very well known what it is, what is its uh, genus zero free energy, which is given by these two functions. So uh, in the ungapped phase, so the one where we expect a confining phase, the free energy goes like g squared over four, while in the gap phase, so where the eigenvalues as a gap on the unit circle, there is this logarithmic piece here. Now, there is a problem though, that we cannot just immediately complexify G and expect that everything goes exactly as before because when you complexify uh, the coupling G, there could be additional contribution to the matrix model that come from uh, different basically distribution and uh, topologies of the eigenvalue distribution. So in particular, the model 
could have the so-called multi-cut phases. So very schematically here, uh, I'm writing what it means to solve a multi-cut matrix model. What it means is that we have now to basically sum over all the arrangement of eigenvalues uh, n1 to ns. So n1 n1 to ns, it's the number of eigenvalue in each of the cut. And by cut, I mean the fact that the eigenvalue distribution will be supported on disconnected intervals. So this is in principle a complicated problem where we have to solve the matrix model at large n in each of these cuts and then try to sum over all this configuration. And there's an additional uh, difficulty that we need to overcome because for a given complex G, uh, we can think that there's gonna be a, a, a dominant saddle at large n, but there, will, there might also be many other subdominant saddles which are uh, which we should think that they might contribute to the path integral uh, by basically something that is like a matrix model instant on tunneling and this tunneling is uh, mediated by this action a of g which in certain specific example can be computed exactly so we can glean some information about this object now uh, what we decided to do is to take a concrete approach which is we wanted to study two, the two regions that we understand very well at real G, so the one cut regions where we have the gapped and ungapped phase. And we wanted to understand how very precisely how to analytically continue them. And luckily we could do that because we also had the information of what is um, this instant on action in both the gapped and ungapped phase because it was computed in a work by Marinho. So we devised a criterion to follow in order to understand when a one cut solution has a meaningful uh, analytic continuation. And this criterion is physically very simple. So we expect that these one cut phases can be analytically continued to the complex uh, G plane. Whenever, and in a, in a reliable way, we can do that whenever we also suppress this uh, matrix model instant on tunneling. And that is going to be true when the real part of the instant on action will be positive. So for example, if we, in, if we are interested in the gap phase, we will have to compute, we will have to take the gap one cut instant on action and then study it as a function of G in general. And then we will know that whether or not there is a region where we can study the matrix model with some confidence in that region. And of course you can do the same also in the ungapped phase. And an interesting uh, an result of this analysis is that you can, in fact, uh, extend and reproduce everything that we know about the gross width and Wadia matrix model. So in this, blue, in this blue and orange region, this will be the analytic continuation of these two uh, one cut phases. And indeed, we see right away that if we go to the line where the imaginary part of G is zero, we indeed recover the old analysis of gross width and Wadia. And then, of course, in this model, there will be phases at complex G where the model has multi-cut solution, which, and this in principle could be a problem, especially if we are interested in physics that happens in these regions over here because the model has not been solved in these multi-cut phases. But I'm going to argue for you that in the region where we want to work today, these multi-cuts phases will not be relevant, so we shouldn't worry about them. This is not the end of the story, though, because this whole business was about the second integral in that uh, multiple integral that I was telling you before. So now we still have to make another integration over G, over this complex G plane. And we know that uh, that integral can be done. And in general, the form of that integral will be a sum over saddles in G of an exponential function of n squared times a function Q, where Q is the, the factor that was in the Gaussian integral plus the genus zero free energy of the gross width and Wadia model that we now understand and that we now have, a, have the power to analytically continue. So clearly this integral have a trivial saddle at g star equals zero. And this is not very interesting because in that saddle, the model will be certainly confined. But there is a more interesting saddle in g star, which is located at this point here. And this saddle g star is very useful because uh, we can study uh, the effects of this saddle g star in this uh, uh, in this integral at large n, and we will be able to find that there is a region where this function q of a1 and g is positive, 
and in this region we we are sure that the integral will have a deconfining behavior with a positive n squared exponential term. So we can immediately draw the following diagram. So in the following diagram, we can see I'm denoting by CD, something that we call the deconfinement curve. CD is just the boundary of the real part, or is the boundary of this region that I told you about before. This is the region where we expect deconfinement. And this boundary tells us uh, precisely where we expect deconfinement to take place. So before this red line, we do not expect deconfinement to take place. And this is actually uh, uh, you know, a, a different story than the previous one in the real case for two reasons. So first of all, if we have real A1, of course the entire G integral is over the real line and the deconfinement curve pinches to a point. So there is a, the discussion, it goes back exactly as, as we said before. But we can see again that um, uh, now even, so in the, in the real, in the, in the situation where G is, com where G is complex, uh, there could be points here in this, blue, in this blue region where the real part of A1 is positive according to this uh, situation here, but there is no uh, deconfinement. So we cannot immediately determine whether or not there is deconfinement in this region. I mean, there is not going to be any be, uh, just by looking at the real part of A1. The more refined thing to do is to look at this, at this curve in the complex G plane. And uh, another thing that, so, and this will have a consequence. This will have a consequence that any, any prediction we were making about the confinement will be now slightly delayed because of the fact that this curve is bending in the G plane. And another interesting thing is that in the blue region, both the gapped and ungapped phase of the complex uh, matrix model are completely uh, well-defined and they coexist. So the, if, if you go in this blue region, you can certainly define both phases for the large N matrix model. There is no, uh, you know, not, none of them cease to exist in this blue region, but here the gap phase in the blue region is, is, uh, is dominating. And so the model will show a confining behavior. And once we go across this red line, the two phases will switch its dominance and we will see the confinement. And we will see that this has a dual description in gravity in a very precise way. So let me, let me again stress that if A1 was real, again, also the blue region pinches to a point, And so we can never talk about coexistence. So there was never a notion in which in the real case, uh, we could really talk about a, a purely first order phase. Now, I told you that I'm interested in, in the super conformal index. So let me just tell you how this uh, super conformal index entered the story. The super conformal index is a very general observable that uh, belongs to any n equal one SCFTs. And it, you can define it as the partition function of the supersymmetric theory on S3 times S1. And it counts supersymmetric states uh, uh, in radial quantization. These are a BPS local operator and uh, that, and we know this by the state operator correspondence. And in particular, this is a, very robust observable that is independent of exactly marginal deformation. So what we do to define this object is to pick a supercharge among the n equal one supercharges that has the following uh, anti-commutator. And this combination of delta J1 and R, where R is the U1R charge and J1 is the left SU2 acting on the three sphere, will define for us what it means to have an Hilbert space of BPS operator. So the index takes the following form is the trace over this Hilbert space of minus one to the F. And then we have these two additional fugacities P and Q, uh, which basically help us refining this count. Now, of course, if we think about n equal one as a very special case of n equal four, um, we will see that this index is responsible for the counting of 116 BPS local operators. But there is a non-trivial problem here because this index has a minus one to the F in the trace. So of course, when we go to large N, we have to make sure that we, we sort of can capture the black hole degeneracy. And that's not obvious because there can be huge cancellations in this trace. But the, the crucial point here is that the index belong to the same class of unitary matrix model that we already introduced. So it has 
it belongs to the same class that I introduced at the beginning, where the uh, coefficients a n are as a function of the fugacities p and q are defined by this function here. And uh, it's been known for uh, quite a, some time after the, the discovery of the superconformal index that if p and q are real, and they are both between zero and one. Uh, unfortunately, all these coefficients are negative and exactly for the same reason that I told you at the beginning at large n, this means that the index scale as order one, where the trace u to the n would be the most dominant contribution. And this will give us a confined phase, but of course uh, this is kind of disappointing because that's exactly the opposite that we expect in this ADS CFT description. So we wanna find extremal black holes and so we, we need like rapidly growing index and non, not disorder one answer. So let me just explain to you what would be responsible for the growth of the index in the dual gravitational picture. As I told you, we want to find 116 BPS black hole in ADS5. These were discovered a long time ago and they are characterized by three, you wanna, three uh, electric charges. They belong to the maximal torus inside the SO6 R symmetry of n equal four. They also have uh, two angular momenta. And uh, there's a non-trivial relation between the electric and angular momentum charges that is a non-linear one. And that makes make it that the black hole has to satisfy in order to be extremal. So the, I'll, today I'm just gonna focus on the simplest example of a black hole in this, in this context, which is the one with all charges and all angular momentum equal. And uh, the bekenstein hawking entropy in this case is known and it's given by this formula over here. And so in particular here, we have to think that we are somehow in the grand canonical ensemble where all angular momentum charges and so entropy as well will scale as order n squared at large n. So, this connects with the certain recent developments about the study of the index that uh, so it was understood not long time ago that or directly from the the logarithm of the index of the superconformal index there is a way to obtain this bekenstein hawking entropy by performing a legend transform of the logarithm of the index and this transformation is the, the typical one where we introduce chemical potential, delta and omega for the electric charges and the angular momenta. And it is a, a, an extremization with a constraint. So we need to take derivative with respect of delta and omega and set this thing to zero. And there is a non-trivial thing here that uh, we will understand very soon that these uh, chemical potential are in general uh, complex and they are subject to the following identification. This is due to supersymmetry uh, also in the gravitational solution. So in general, you might worry because this process of extremization might produce for you, uh, so if you have complex value of delta and omega, you might be worried that maybe the entropy will be complex. But that's not what's gonna happen because, because of this nonlinear relationship that, uh, that is lying around between charges and angular momenta, when you are going to evaluate the value of the black hole entropy on shell, none of this complex fugacity will play a role. And the, I mean, none of this will spoil the reality of the black hole entropy. So this is a very important point. And in particular at large n, we can uh, identify the logarithm of this partition function exactly because we are working in the grand canonical ensemble with the gravitational free energy, which we can express in this simple form here. And in order to define the Hawking page transition in gravity, we need to see where is the line in this uh, fugacity plane omega, where the, where the where basically the free energy goes from a behavior of order n squared or to a behavior of order one. And this line is very easy to identify because it's basically the locus where the real part of the free energy is equal to zero. And I'm parameterizing this. So this is a curve that the red curve that I'm drawing here. So this is the locus in omega plane where uh, the free energy is, the real part of the free energy is zero. And I'm parameterizing the fugacity omega with this uh, y and argument psi for a reason that will be clear soon. So all this uh, development in gravity that has to do with uh, understanding this Legend transform and the presence of complex chemical potential is matched very uh, neatly in, in the physics of, uh, super, of the supersymmetric index. 
And this has to do with like some subtle uh, aspects of uh, the supersymmetry and curve background. In particular, these parameters P and Q that I was referring to that appeared in the index, they, are also, they also have a global meaning at the level of the super conformal index. So they, they are basically parameterizing the complex structure moduli on a space which has a topology of S3 times S1. This was emphasized in this work here. And in particular, a very, very important point here is that if you actually look at the definition that I gave you of the super conformal index, uh, because of these powers of uh, one third that appears in over P and Q, the index very simply will not be a single valued function of P and Q, but uh, uh, it more precisely, this index will live on some triple cover of the moduli space of complex structure for these manifolds with topology S3 times S1. These are, these are also referred to as like primary of surfaces. Now, if you very carefully adopt a parameterization where P, which we take here, that where P is equal to Q and this is equal to this Y times E to the Psi, you can study the global behavior of the index as a function of this y and psi. And this per perfectly match with what we expect with gravity. So in the, in, the, in the first sheet of the index, there's not gonna be any deconfinement, but when you study the index as a function of these complex fugacities, uh, you will find uh, deconfinement behavior, but not on the first sheet, the one where that basically we know already didn't deconfine, but the other two. And the really nice things about the matrix model description is that we can compute this curve using the matrix model description and match what we expect from all these different point of views. So let me show you how we did that. So as I told you now, we have promoted P, the fugacity to this general complex parameter. So now the couplings inside the original matrix model will be complex. And so we already have all the tools that we, had, we have introduced to study this problem. So for example, if you wanna study the model with just A1, we just need to plug in the value of A1 from the super conformal index and study again the deconfinement curve for the model with just A1, for example. And we did that, but there is an important caveat that I already told you. So the model is, a, is describing a first order transition. So there is no way in which we can uh, ignore the contribution of IR couplings AN because there is no way in, we, in which we can isolate universally just the first coupling as we would do instead if the transition was weaker. So in order so to, to understand this problem, you cannot really ignore the IR AN, but you have to study their effects on the large N matrix model. But this in principle could be really bad because you could have no control over this AN. But it turns out that uh, quite remarkably uh, in the region where we wanna make this study, the effects of these uh, higher couplings is numerically small. So even though we cannot prove that there is a parametric separation between the couplings, we can still quantify how big they are. And we can still, and so we, we, you, you can find out that we will be numerically small and you can basically go on doing large N perturbation theory of the matrix model and include higher and higher effects in AN because you know all of them and you know the physics of this complex matrix model. But uh, it's quite remarkable that already with the second coupling, so keeping a model that has two complex coupling, you can match uh, very precisely the prediction uh, that you have from gravity. So this, let me remind you, this red curve is the red curve that we expect from the Hawking page transition. The blue curve would be the curve of deconfinement of the model with just one coupling. And you see, this would be pretty far away. So if we were to claim that this complex coupling model would be say a weaker order phase transition, this would be the end and we would have some kind of mismatch between these two transitions between gravity and the unitary matrix model. But this is fixed just by looking at the effects of this higher coupling. And so there is no unfamiliar gravitational saddle that somehow could live here. And just the effects of this model can explain this physics. And so uh, I think that uh, this is again, like a nice confirmation of the physics of AES-CFT, even in this uh, situation 
where there could be some subtle effects because of complex couplings. And so with this, I'm, gonna to, I'm going to conclude and I want to thank you all for your attention. And I also wanna thank all the other speakers for making such a wonderful event. Great, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Other questions for Luigi? I will ask one until everyone else has decided what they want to ask. Um, can you explain again why these, um, these multi-cut ones are not important? I think I missed that. Could you just repeat that? Yeah, please? it's not just uh, obvious, but the, so basically when you study, so okay, if I don't have a, well, imagine that you are studying now this, uh, well, okay. Imagine that you are trying to draw this picture now in this, uh, for basically now G will, so G here depends on A1. Where do I have it? G depends on A1. Yeah. A1 in N equal four is known. So we can study basically where the multi-cut phases are and we can somehow understand where they lie when I try to understand where, the, where this region of deconfinement is. And what happens is that uh, importantly, this, this region kind of lie in, over here. I see. So they're always in distinct regions, so yeah. you can be sure that they Actually, don't this is also important for uh, the duality with gravity, because suppose that you know nothing about the matrix model, but you only have gravity. You know by this analysis that there, there, is, there shouldn't be any deconfinement behavior. So this, this has to be like, I would say it's like an important point. Cool. Are there any other questions? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Yes. Uh, okay, I have a similar question about this. Uh, could you show me this uh, phase uh, diagram of this uh, GWW matrix model? Probably one page earlier. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Wait. Uh, wait, wait. Uh. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, this one. Yeah, so at least for the audio, I mean, so real coupling constant case, so their phase boundary is known to be the uh, third order I mean, yes. phase boundary. Yes, yes. but uh, okay, do, do, is it possible to know the order of the uh, phase transition for other boundaries? I mean, especially for this complex, uh, I mean, yeah, the boundary so, between the match cut or something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think that in the, okay, so the way I see it is that in the complex uh, model, this uh, three, third order is completely, it, it's gone, it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so I, I want to say this, so, so the, it's much, semi, it's okay, I would say that even for the, for the, okay, I, I just, okay, I'll, may, I'll stop here with this comment, but uh, yeah, maybe there is a little bit more that can be said, but I don't want to, mm -hmm. I'm just very sure that the third order phase is gone by going to complex coupling. Okay, so you mean that this uh, only this black point is only the phase yeah. third order, and everything yeah. else is uh, yeah. not sure. Exactly. Okay, I see. Thank no, you. well, everything else, I think you could. Uh, it, then there is a question whether or not is uh, more close to a weekly first or a first in this mm -hmm. talking about the gross width and void. Yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, that question is. Uh, I, I, anyway, I would expect this first order, but I haven't proven. Mm -hmm. in the okay. week yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, please, Joe. Hey, um, hi. Uh, hi, Luigi. Nice talk. Um, so uh, how hard would it be to compute A3? Oh, we, we can do that. You so can do systematically. It just, uh, it's not even, like, there's almost no effects in this curve. Like, we, we went on for quite a while. It's kind of, it's impressive just uh, how little. So it gets closer and closer to Yeah, it the, gets uh, closer and closer. Oh, okay, I see. It's just computation, you know, as the more you crank up this business. Yeah, no, I understand. I just I was wondering how far you could go and basically see it converge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't see any further media questions. Uh, before we close, I want to thank all the, or we organizers want to thank all the speakers. We really put this together within like, I think 10 days or two weeks. 
So it was impressive. Everyone said yes, and everybody gave fantastic talks. So I think it was really great. Um, let's thank Luigi again, and also all the speakers from this last session. And uh, I suggest we stop the recording, and then you can.